Hi everyone, I'm Dale Smith, aka Journo Dale, and we're here to talk about Canadian politics. It's time to take some of your questions, and our first question comes from Martin on the Patreon, who asks, should Canada hold a formal investiture for King Charles? Could Canada? Uh, and Martin goes on to say, my understanding, and I know you'll correct me if I'm wrong, is that the Crown of Canada did not become fully separate uh, until the Constitution was patriated. That is wrong. Uh, um, if so, this is the first opportunity for a formal uh, installation of our own monarch. Would it help or hurt our constitutional system to request or insist on a formal ceremony? Um, and Martin also notes that the previous Queen Elizabeth II was ceremonially presented with honours of Scotland uh, in Scotland a couple of weeks after her formal coronation in London and presumes something similar will happen with Charles. Um, and why shouldn't the realms have similar ceremonies? Um, okay, first of all, for the correction, the Crown of Canada became separate um, after the Statute of Westminster in 1931. Uh, patriation in 1982 was about amending our own constitution. So, um, and that, and in the process of that, recreated the formula by which um, those amendments happen on a domestic basis. But previously, the crown was separate, but we still had to basically apply to the um, United Kingdom Parliament in order to uh, make any uh, changes to our constitution. Um, 1982 is where that changed. Um, as for the overall question, I personally think that we should hold a, a formal investiture for the King of Canada. Um, I don't think it happened um, with uh, the previous Queen because in most respects, Canada was still very culturally British at the time. Um, Canadian citizen citizenship itself was only five years old. Um, most of those people or most of people in Canada had been born British subjects. Um, we didn't have our own flag. We were using um, the red ensign, which was um, basically was wasn't even official at that point, but it was largely a British flag with Canadian coat of arms on it. Um, you know, we didn't have a, a national anthem. We were all just using "God Save the Queen." Um, those kinds of things. So we didn't have much of a cultural identity separate from Britain at as much at the time. Um, at least in the mainstream. And I think that's partially why, you know, when we had the, the coronation, it was still very much a British affair. Even though there was mention of Canada in uh, during that ceremony, um, because we were a, a separate crown and realm at the time, but it was still very much a very British affair. I think what is different now is that Canada and all of the other realms have matured a lot and grown culturally separate from the UK in that regard. Um, and that's why I think it would actually be a really good idea. And in Canada in particular, because um, our treaties with First Nations are directly with the Crown, I think this would be a really good opportunity for some kind of affirmation of those treaties in terms of um, involving uh, the Indigenous communities as part of this Canadian investiture um, and saying, you know, this is this is the, the treaty relationship that happens. Um, and kind of a reminder of that particular fact, because it's not something a lot of people necessarily properly understand. Um, and I think um, this would be a good opportunity in order to kind of reinforce that point. And, you know, not only for the Crown of Canada in terms of our own parliamentary system and so on, but this treaty relationship, because that is foundationally of the land that we are on in this country. Um, and and I think that that kind of a, a, a formal investiture in Canada would be a really great idea for how to integrate that and, and really bring that, uh, that reality of how Canada works um, into, the, into the public consciousness. So I think that would be a great idea personally. Um, do I think this government will do it? No, this particular government likes to minimize the crown at any and every opportunity, um, which I personally think is a problem, but this is just me and um, they have their own particular uh, views on this. Um, but uh, 
yeah, I that's that's where I think we should go. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have any hope that that's what will happen. Our second question is on Twitter, and the user is Offshore1951, who asks, what rules are in Parliament that would call out a politician who is demonstrably lying? Um, unfortunately, the rules in Parliament state that calling someone out for lying is considered unparliamentary, and um, then you are forced to apologize for uh, making such an accusation, and if you don't, then you can be removed from the chamber for a day or however uh, long the speaker determines. Um, and that's the sad, unfortunate reality around that. Um, and that's why people need to be very careful with how they accuse other parties of not telling the truth um, during debate. And um, it can be a really fraught tightrope. And unfortunately, this is one of those kinds of things where our rules are written for people who behave in good faith. Um, and when people don't behave in good faith, it's really hard to have rules around that. Um, and it, it, there is a certain school of thought where we could empower the speaker to determine that, but that would also have the possibility of basically burdening the speaker with needing to determine the truth of every statement that, uh, is made in the House of Commons, which could be extremely onerous, particularly in this day and age. Um, so that's the unfortunate way the rules work. Um, I've tried finding it in the Canadian uh, procedural manuals and I couldn't, but I have seen in the UK a few examples of where a particular egregious mistruth from the government or someone in particular that affected the course of debate would be referred to a committee um, in order to determine um, what happens. And I believe it's their privileges committee, which in Canada is uh, the modern uh, name of that is the Procedure and House Affairs Committee. Um, and uh, that's um, something I think we need to think about. Um, because we are in a particular age where um, people not telling the truth has become weaponized, particularly in parliamentary debate, particularly when it is becoming um, fodder for essentially social media shit posts that um, they then distribute with something that is not true in them and the government not at necessarily refuting that. Um, because this government is really, really terrible at refuting things that are not true and simply responds with, you know, some good news pablum, um, which is a problem. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, the rules don't really give much in the way of, of an ability to call someone out. Um, and that's something that we need to grapple with as, <laughs> as a parliament, as a culture, um, as a country, because, um... Yeah, it's hard to figure how um, how to make this uh, how to have a better quality of debate without um, uh, bur you know turning into needing to send everything to a committee every time something that is not true is said in the house, but at the same time not derailing debate every single time that um, uh, someone calls out something that isn't true, and that's partially why it's considered unparliamentary is because it has the uh, ability to derail debate but at the same time um yeah we need to we need to figure out some kind of a compromise here and um i wish i had a better answer for that but unfortunately that's the way the rules are structured currently that's everything for this week join us again next week for some more canadian politics i'm dale smith that's at journal underscore dale on twitter and don't forget to like the video, share, subscribe, and support us on Patreon. Thanks, everyone.